Anyone who's been following this channel for a while knows that it was only a matter of time before I dedicated a video to the one group that unites us all as humans. I'm sure at one point in time, possibly in our childhood, we all called them Neanderthals instead of Neanderthal, but just remember Neanderthal is a German word and the Germans aren't too good at pronouncing the TH sound. Neanderthals were the dominant species in a large chunk of land in Eurasia for 20 times longer than humans were, and Neanderthals are indeed a separate species from humans, or at the very least a subspecies, but there are many misconceptions surrounding the Neanderthals and other hominids that not only coexisted with modern humans, but also interacted with, traded with, and yes, even mated with. Most people are well aware of this by now, but Neanderthals were actually not the lumbering, brain-dead troglodytes that the general public assumed them to be, and most paleobiologists place the upper levels of their intelligence either at or even slightly above that of humans at the time. Humans did not evolve from Neanderthals, as some may think, nor are they the supposed missing link between modern humans and the primates, and the name Neanderthal is not synonymous with the term caveman, although when conjuring up images of ancient humans and western pop culture, it's almost a given that the depiction will be more or less based upon that of our ancient extinct cousins. But did Neanderthal really go extinct? Well, it all goes back several hundred thousand years ago, a few million years after our ancestors learned to walk on two legs, back when humans still hadn't learned how to talk or cook or even wear clothes for all that it's worth, and a rogue group of hominids decided that they had enough of Africa and left for the larger landmass of Eurasia. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens belong to the same genus known as Homo. Yeah, yeah, I know, very funny. But Homo is just a Latin term for human, so technically Neanderthals and other similar hominids are classified as human, but in this video and in general, the term human is used only for modern Homo sapiens, although the two groups did share a significant amount, over 99% of DNA. It would be incorrect to make an analogy between Neanderthals and humans in the modern human races we see today on Earth, as all human races, however diverse in phenotype, are only separated by around 60 to 100,000 years of evolution, meaning that all people on Earth today have a common ancestor from around that time, while for Neanderthals and humans, the most recent common ancestor stretches back 400,000 to 800,000 years, which goes to show the much greater genetic gap between the two species, although for some even more relevant comparison, humans and chimpanzees are believed to have split some 6 million years ago. So yes, all modern human groups are all far more closely related to each other than to Neanderthal, even though humans have branched off to have extreme phenotypic diversity in the past tens of thousands of years, mainly because of the vast stretches of the planet that we have spread out over. Think of this in the same way that dogs and wolves diverged from each other some tens of thousands of years ago, yet because of natural selection and selective breeding, dogs have a wide array of physical attributes, despite all being the same species. Humans would have still been bumbling around on the Great Savannah of Africa for hundreds of thousands of years before we got the idea to cross one of the few land connections from Africa to Eurasia, and we found that we were not the only intelligent beings to explore this land. Neanderthals had established themselves as hunters in a large portion of this landmass, stretching from Western Europe to Northern Asia, and perhaps most interestingly, a third species of hominid known as Denisovans has also been recently discovered to have inhabited parts of Siberia down to Southeast Asia during the same time period, with a small overlap in territory between the two. It's important to realize that this was long before agriculture, pastoralism, or permanent settlements, so Neanderthals and Denisovans wouldn't have had any sort of empires, civilizations, or anything like that. Unfortunately, little to nothing is known of paleo-human language, religion, or culture, but from fossilized remains found over this region, we've been able to piece together what an average Neanderthal would have looked like, and needless to say, it isn't too flattering, as Neanderthal's large brow, sunken chin, and receding forehead do give the stereotypical caveman appearance, and all around, Neanderthal would have been much stockier, muscular, and slightly shorter than their human counterpart. 
As to the exact phenotypic traits of the Neanderthal, we'll never know, especially considering that just in the same manner as modern humans, Neanderthals had separated and diverged into several different clusters or races spread across Eurasia, who had been divided for at least 80,000 years. And as mentioned earlier, this is about the same time frame of divergence that took place between many human races on the planet today. So it would be safe to assume that these different clusters of Neanderthal would have looked quite distinct, or at the very least would have some genetic or phenotypic trait that could distinguish them, and recent insights have revealed that Neanderthal in the east may have had brown skin with dark eyes and hair, while those in the west may have had lighter skin and possibly even blonde or red hair, an example of convergent evolution when compared to the modern humans who inhabit this region today. Again, their larger craniums did give them a larger brain, which made them a bit smarter than the average Homo sapien at the time. And although it is difficult to determine exactly why the Neanderthals died off, most likely a combination of climate change and the invading humans dried up their traditional food source, being unable to compete with the adaptability of the Homo sapiens. The last legacy left behind by the Neanderthals after their demise directly and indirectly from the humans was their genes, as it is now considered fact in the scientific community that Neanderthals and humans did indeed reproduce and their DNA lives on in modern humans today. Not all humans, mind you, but we'll get to that later. For some context, these members of the early human family had far more in common with each other genetically than other closely related species in the animal kingdom such as donkeys and horses or lions and tigers, both of which can indeed have healthy offspring, but very often these hybrid animals have great difficulty in reproducing, and this was most likely true for human Neanderthal hybrids as well. However, there is extremely conflicting information on just how this reproductive incontinence manifested, with some sources claiming that only Neanderthal men and human women were able to successfully reproduce and human men wouldn't have been able to sire children with Neanderthal women, while some sources claim literally the exact opposite, while some claim that both genders of each species was able to reproduce with each other, but it was only the female hybrids that were able to have offspring, as male hybrids would have been sterile. Other sources still claim that both genders were able to reproduce with each other, but that only human men would have married with Neanderthal women as the invading humans arrived in Neanderthal territory as conquerors, slaughtering the men and taking their wives as their own. Denisovans were also genetically similar enough to humans that they were able to reproduce with them, as well as with Neanderthal. So in prehistoric Eurasia, there were human Neanderthal, Neanderthal Denisovan, and Denisovan human hybrids lurking around the entire supercontinent, although Denisovan admixture in humans was more or less relegated to the eastern half of the continent, especially in the former Sundaland. Now, strangely enough, only four confirmed samples of Denisovans have ever been discovered, a finger bone, a toe bone, and two teeth. But from these samples, scientists have deduced that Denisovan was similar in build to Neanderthal, possibly even larger, taller, and more muscular. Neanderthals and Denisovans diverged from a common ancestor a few hundred thousand years after they diverged from humans, and most likely Neanderthals and Denisovans had 23 sets of chromosomes, same as Homo sapiens. Without a doubt, the largest degree of Neanderthal admixture in modern humans is not in Europeans, as is frequently espoused, but actually in East Asians, having around 20 to 30 percent higher rates of admixture on average than Western Eurasians, such as Europeans, Middle Easterners, or South Asians, having around 4% and 2% respectively, although it should be noted that these figures are constantly being revised as new information is obtained. When it comes to Denisovan admixture, the distribution is a bit more erratic, but is most prominent in the people groups of the former landmass of Sahul, which previously encompassed New Guinea, Australia, and other Melanesian islands. Today, Melanesians, Papuans, and Australian Aborigines have the highest degree of Denisovan admixture at 6 to 4%, with other Negrito populations of maritime Southeast Asia having slightly less, while Eastern Eurasians and Amerindians have trace amounts from admixture with these other racial groups. Groups. In Sub-Saharan Africa, Bantus and other Niger-Congo peoples have an admixture rate of around 0 to 0.2% Neanderthal DNA, 
For Kushites and Horn Africans, the rate is around 0.6 to 1.2 percent. In the Malagasy ethnic groups on the island of Madagascar, they would contain average rates of Neanderthal at 1 to 3 percent and Denisovan around 0.5 percent admixture from the Southeast Asians and other Eurasian migrants who have mixed with the Bantu populations over the centuries. While for the isolated hunter-gatherer populations of Africa, such as the Congo Pygmies and Khoisan tribes of the Kalahari Desert, Neanderthal Neanderthal or Denisovan input is almost entirely absent, and any supposed Neanderthal DNA found in these groups, even in trace amounts, can be assumed to be noise or obtained from recent admixture from other peoples. However, and this is quite important, through recent DNA analysis, it has actually been hypothesized that the hunter-gatherer groups of Africa may actually contain admixture from a separate archaic human group living in southern Africa some tens of thousands of years ago, who were just as genetically different distant from humans as Neanderthals or Denisovans. Little to nothing is known of this as of yet unnamed hominid population, but it's safe to say that the hunter-gatherer populations of Sub-Saharan Africa, including the Khoisan and Pygmies, have the largest amount of admixture, but no samples have been discovered. So the only conclusions that can be made is by looking at the genomes of these modern people. One of the last hominid species that may have also interacted with ancient humans was Homo floresiensis, aka the Hobbit Man from Indonesia, standing just three and a half feet tall, and their features were certainly more simian-like than any of the other hominids, seeing as to how they diverged nearly three million years ago, meaning their genetics would almost certainly not be compatible with humans. They are also believed to have gone extinct only 40 to 50,000 years ago, meaning that similar to Neanderthal and Denisovan, the arrival of humans and their slice of the planet quickly meant their demise, although unlike these two groups, they were not absorbed through interbreeding. The ways that Neanderthal and other hominid admixture has influenced the genetics of modern humans is still being researched to this day, and again, there's a lot of conflicting data on the matter, and new discoveries are being made all the time, which paints an even more complex, multifaceted picture of human history and genetics. I know a lot of people might be hesitant to learn about human evolution due to religious convictions, but I see no reason why any religious philosophy can't coexist, and you should never be afraid of gaining new knowledge. So go ahead and let me know your thoughts on these paleo humans, and for today's poll, let me know which hominid you find to be the most interesting. And as always, this has been Mason. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.